Michelle Prince, founder and CEO of Performance Publishing Group, making a difference one story at a time. We'll be shining the light on successful founders, entrepreneurs, business owners, and leaders that are getting results and making a difference. We'll talk about how they built their businesses, are creating movements, and leveraging the power of authority in their own lives. Be sure to stick around to the end of the show and we'll reveal how you can be our next guest. Let's get started. Hey there, Michelle Prince here, host of the Power of Authority Spotlight podcast. This was a special episode where I'm on a panel with a few other top podcast hosts interviewing a very special guest, somebody that you're definitely going to want to listen into. Um, but before we get to the interview, this episode is brought to you by Performance Publishing Group. At Performance Publishing Group, we provide done-for-you publishing services for people that are looking to build a brand, share their story and make a difference. Uh, we are making a difference one story at a time, and we want to help you to get there. So go to performancepublishinggroup.com. And if you have ever thought about how a book could be the best and greatest business card you've ever used, then you definitely want to check that out, performancepublishinggroup.com. All right, let's get to the episode. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com. I'm joined by a panel of some of the top podcast hosts around. And before you introduce today's Special guest, Michael E. Gerber, the E-Myth. We'll introduce our hosts. And David, why don't you start us off? Hi there, David Nilsson, uh, founder of Docs of Talent and the host of the Futures Borderless podcast, where we highlight thought leaders and entrepreneurs from around the world. And I'm Josh Hadley. I'm the host of the Ecom Breakthrough podcast, where I interviewed the top business leaders in e-commerce to help share actionable steps that our audience can take to grow from seven-figure e-com businesses to eight figures and beyond. And I'm Michelle Prince, host of the Power of Authority Spotlight, where we shine the light on business owners, entrepreneurs, leaders who are building a brand, they're building a platform, and they're using their story to build their authority. And I am Tom Foster. I do the World of Marketing podcast, and I own Foster Web Marketing. We build websites for lawyers and doctors. And I read your book years ago. It was one of the most inspirational books I've ever read. I'm an entrepreneur and I sunk my teeth into your book, Michael. It was one of the it was one of the first ones that set me on my journey. So I am like hero worshiping right now. So it's really an honor to meet you, sir. I feel yeah. like this happens every other interview, Michael, that someone mentions your book is yeah. you know the foundation for them starting. So <laughs> truly foundational. So as a proper intro. You know, Inc. Magazine calls today's guest the world's number one small business guru. He's an entrepreneurial and small business thought leader who's impacted the lives of millions and millions of small business owners and hundreds of thousands of companies worldwide for over 40 years. Michael E. Gerber is the author of the New York Times mega bestseller, not just bestseller, mega bestseller for two consecutive decades, The E Myth Revisited, and nine other worldwide best-selling e-myth books concerning small business, entrepreneurship, leadership, and management. And his mission is to transform the state of small business worldwide, which he's done. Michael, thanks for joining us. My delight. By the way, the readjustment of your script. Okay. It's now 32 uh, e-myth books strong. 32. Awesome. That is fantastic. Congratulations to you, sir. Thank you. You just had one with Austin Clark, who I know, um, a yes. launch of that book uh, for, in the pest control space. Love it. And we promoted that event that you guys did together. So Love that was awesome. Um, so Austin, Austin's a sweetheart. He's great. Um, so David, why don't you start us off? The first question. Sure. Well, uh, uh, first, Michael, I will say similar to Tom, one of the first books I read when I started my entrepreneurial journey and was struggling because I was that entrepreneur that wanted to reinvent everything and change it constantly and paid a little attention to process and procedures. And um, I just thought it was a fantastic book and inspirational for me in terms of how to evolve as a business owner. And I, I guess along those lines, I would ask, you know, when you first wrote the book, I'd be curious, what was the sort of overarching message you were hoping to convey? And then how has that changed uh, since then? You know, if you look at how the world has evolved, how or has it changed? Well, first of all, let me correct something, the assumption you've made, that the world has evolved. 
everybody believes that the world has evolved. It hasn't. The world has devolved. In fact, we are in worse shape today than we've ever been. So then what has evolved? Well, technology is evolved. Um, technology provides us with many tools that we didn't have or even imagined having then when I wrote my book. But what's interesting about those tools is that they are in themselves systems. And they are purported to be systems that will transform the state of a business. The truth is, without what I've written in my core book, uh, nothing will evolve. It will devolve because the systems themselves will be thought to be the market difference that makes the business different. I'd like to add that it's not about making the business different. It's about making the dis business right. And the only way one can make the business right is to make the people right within the business who don't understand why right, the word right, and what the word right really means. That's the most profound impact that Emith Revisited has had because it defined the word right and doing so now more strenuously than I did in the book, but it defines the word right in the right way. And that's why Tom described his experience the way he has, and that's why, David, you've described your definition the way you have, and I'm sure I'll hear very much the same thing from everyone else in this conversation. And please hear me when I say that, that's not my narcissism speaking. That's my realization speaking. That's what that book meant and means and will always mean. And it will mean that forever. You know, Michael, I'm amazed with the book that you, you wrote, E-Myth, and because it is a timeless principles that are going to impact generations to come. And I look forward to my children and my grandchildren being able to read those principles. As an e-commerce business owner, and as I speak with other e-commerce business owners, there's kind of this myth um, that people believe that they could do it all on their own, right? And they what they do is they build a team of a lot of VAs that are surrounding themselves but they are still the core function of the business. There's a quote from your book that I want to read real quick and get your take on it. If your business depends on you, you don't own a business, you have a job. And it's the worst job in the world because you're working for a lunatic. So, Michael, can you provide some additional insight as to if you are That's still great. working in the business, why you don't actually own a business? Well, uh, you, you have to understand that um, oftentimes my statements are stronger than they need to be. Oftentimes as well, they're not strong enough. Uh, but I understand, take that quote, uh, working for a lunatic, and you might change it to be working for an idiot. And it's that idiot that I attempt to transform. And the only way in the world that idiot is going to be transformed is if he or she um, doesn't persist being that idiot in the way they think about who they are, why they do what they do, what they're there to create, and how it's going to be created if, in fact, they grow beyond their idiothood. So it's a master, master, master position to take, Josh. In short, just strenuously understand that while you're not in a people development business, in short, that's not the intent. Um, you are. You get what I mean by that. While you're not in a people development business, you actually are. Everyone is. But the question then becomes, what is people development? 
And how does one approach people development at the very outset? And that is in the positioning of who you are and what you do. So the most critical process in what I describe, how many of you have read Beyond the E-Myth? Yes, well, I've read it. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations, Josh. Folks, um, pick the book up. It's Beyond the E-Myth, The Evolution of an Enterprise from a Company of One to a Company of 1,000. And at the heart of that book is what I describe as the Eightfold Path. And the Eightfold Path is crucial to the process of becoming who you intend to be. Let me describe the eight steps in the Eightfold Path. I have a dream. I have a vision. I have a purpose. I have a mission. I have a job. I have a practice, I have a business, I have an enterprise. A dream, a vision, a purpose, the mission, the job, the practice, the business, the enterprise. The Eightfold Path is the process for growing a company of one to a company of 1,000. It is the process of maturing from doing it yourself, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it to create an enterprise that does it in great measure um, with a great number of individuals who are in fact um, instilled in the process of understanding and appreciating what a dream is, what a vision is, what a purpose is, what a mission is. How many of you are familiar with the dreaming room? So the Dreaming Room is a program that I developed to take one through the first four steps to discover your dream, your vision, your purpose, your mission. If you fail to discover your dream, I'm saying, you'll never discover your vision. If you fail to discover your dream, I say, you'll never discover your purpose. You follow me and follow yeah. me. First this, then that, then that, then that. So there's a process, a mad process, through which you grow in maturity, you grow in eloquence, you grow in ability to literally become the one you can't even imagine becoming at the very outset of this process. My dream, way back then in 19... 77, wow, that's a long time ago. My dream was to transform the state of small business worldwide. My dream was to transform the state of small business worldwide. My vision was to invent the McDonald's of small business development services. My mission was that every small business who in fact accepts this process can indeed realize the outcome I'm describing here. And my mission is and was in 1977 um, that I can invent the business development system that will make it possible for me to realize my dream, my vision, and my purpose. Did that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. And mm -hmm. I love those eight steps in that process that you go through because it truly is like an evolution of growing and developing. It's an evolution. It's an evolution, but it's not based upon evolution. It's based upon something significantly more compelling than evolution. Right. That's what's so critical about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gosh, I had a different question, but now I want to kind of segue a little because, um, well, first of all, 14 years ago, I started my business and about a year in somebody gave me the e-myth revisited and it changed my life. And I would not be in business today had I not read that book and understood the importance of systems and, and process and all the things that I kind of. Well, may, I, may I say, may I say, <laughs> may I say, as each of you say what you're saying. 
um, it, it does, it touches my heart. Uh, because, of course, that's the sole reason I've been doing what I've been doing. And to hear it in such a compelling way, in such an authentic way, is very, very moving to me. So thank you. When you say years ago, years ago, years ago, years ago, and here you are evidencing um, in the, 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 the shine on your faces, in your hearts, how meaningful this was to you. It's very, very compelling to me. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be able to tell you that because it really it is true. And it's interesting when you start talking about the people development, and this is where my question changed. So I came from, and my my background is in people development. Um, I worked with Zig Ziglar. And when I started my business, I thought that's all I really needed. And that's why the e really helped me because I realized I needed more than just my passion, more than just those skills. I needed the systems. But what I'm hearing you say with the beyond the e-myth, it's really, it, it it isn't one or the other. It is both. But what what is what is something a brand new business owner can do to implement that quicker? Because I, I know for me, I wish I would have been able to implement this earlier to take that dream, mission, vision, and then transfer it into the systems and processes that, is there another way? Is there a faster way? Is there a better way than what people are doing today? Because I see a lot of business owners who have even read it still struggle. And I'll raise my hand in that sometimes too. Uh, faster uh, doesn't work in my world. Yeah. But it doesn't work in yours either. Mm -hmm. And it's simply a product of our time. Faster, 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 faster. Everybody wants faster when in fact they can't even do slower. And so I'm suggesting that first thing you can say to every single person in the room, don't talk faster to me. Faster never has worked. And if it has, it's an accident. If you attempt to emulate faster, you're attempting to emulate stupid. Because what you'll discover at the end of faster is you haven't gotten there you only thought you had. And the problem is, it's going to kill you faster than you can even imagine. It's slower. The Zen of it, it's slower. It's slower. Speak to me slowly. Measure your words as you speak to me slowly take this in slowly practice it slowly definitively honestly earnestly with all of your being as you go into the martial arts there is no you get there faster stupid it's impossible to understand you've got to do this 1,000 times, you've got to do this 3,000 times, and you've got to do this 3,000 times artfully. So artfully that you can't even conceive of how you got to this point of doing this 1,000 times, 10,000 times. A gentleman who's one of my co-authors told me that he reread the Emith Revisited 39 times. Hear me, he reread it 39 times. That he never would have been able to do it so artfully had he not reread it 39 times. You say that to somebody who's in a hurry. You follow me, Michelle. <laughs> yeah. Michelle, you follow me. I do. I do. Understand that you're not actually attempting to teach them how to do it faster. You're attempting to get it faster yourself mm -hmm. because they're making a demand on you faster, 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 Michelle. And because you're concerned, you're not going to be able to sustain your relationship with them unless you respond to them in kind you're forced 
to look for faster. Hear me, be the artful one who looks for slower. In every single thing you do, be the artful one who looks for slower and speak it more slowly, more definitively, in contradiction to their requirement for you to go faster. Wow. That's it's the best thing I can say awesome. to you. No, that's great advice. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's you have great. no idea. You have absolutely no idea the profound impact that will have on the people who work with you as they slow down, as they give themselves up to the pace of art. You don't get art done quickly. You do it, and 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 you're still a slob. You're still a jerk. You're still a beginner. So you must turn to everyone who says that and say, you're a beginner, moron. You're a beginner. Don't you dare ask me for a quick solution to become an artist. Don't you dare ask me for something that's impossible to give. Now, let's all slow down. And you set that pace, you can feel that pace being set as you set that pace. Follow me. As you set that pace, you set their hearts. And if you set their hearts appropriately, you set their imagination appropriately. And you surround yourself with individuals who are there for the long term. Who are there for the long term. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine your students being there for the long term? Can you feel the difference that makes? Mm -hmm. So imagine your martial arts class. You follow me? You're all martial art leaders, gurus. Imagine your martial arts class slowing down. As you begin to see that, everything changes. Well, Michael, that is fantastic. And man, you are such an inspiration. Um, you are the foundation. Like everybody just has copied you for the last, since you wrote the book, everybody's just copied you and had some kind of version of what you came up with. So I've got a couple of questions. One is, how were you inspired to do it in the first place? Did you have a business that you were like, I'm an idiot. I got to help other people. Were you observing others, friends or your, your family or? It, what inspired you to go write the book in the first place? Well, um, I wasn't inspired to write the book until I did the work. So working for 10 years uh, with small businesses um, at the request of a, a very close friend of mine who had an advertising agency in Silicon Valley. And he had small business clients. And um, he told me about his problem with one particular client. And he asked me if I would come visit that client um, to help him um, fix the problem he was having. And I said to my friend, and my friend's name is Ace Remus. Um, and Ace is still a friend. And he's my, my sister's husband. Ah. Very good. 
And he said, he, he said, I don't know anything about business. I have no idea how I can help. He said, Michael, you know more than you think you do. Just come with me. Let's meet the guy and let's see what happens. So being the agreeable, agreeable sort that I am, <laughs> and I love when I say that, being the agreeable sort that I am, I said, okay, sure, let's go. So I sat down with the guy and um, um, Ace then immediately said, guys, I'm going to take off. Um, get to know each other. I'll be back in an hour to pick my up. First thing the guy asked me um, as he looked at his watch, <laughs> so what do you know about my business, Michael? Um, nothing. Because I didn't. And I wasn't interested in asking Ace anything about the business. And he said, well, what do you know about my product? And I said, less than that. And he really looked discomforted. Well, if you don't know anything about my business and you don't know anything about my product, how in the world can you help me? I said, I haven't a clue. I told Ace that. Ace said he thinks I can, and we're here to meet to find out how. So the best way I know to do that is to get to ask you questions and to preserve the answers that you give me. So let's get started. And that's what we did. I began to ask him questions. And he began to answer them. And gradually, over a very short period of time, it became obvious to me why the guy had the problem the guy had. It wasn't that I didn't know about his business. It wasn't that I didn't know about his product. It's that he didn't. <laughs> it became so transparent. <laughs> In any case, that's how this all started. And I solved that guy's problem. Um, and um, Ace asked me to meet with the second client and then a third client. And that's how I got into the business I'm in. It's very good. Um, because I began to realize that Ace didn't know what business he was in. And Ace didn't understand his product. Because Ace, in the advertising business, was selling something that he shouldn't be selling because he was selling it to people who needed something completely different. And that completely different is what I set out to create. Michael, I have a question. You said something a few minutes ago that just was really uh, got me thinking. I, first of all, I, I will read. Wait, wait, a second, wait a second, David. I want to, Tom had several questions he wanted to conclude. So can yes. we do that? Thank you. Thank you. I have, I, the other question I had is you've written several, many books. And, and it is amazing to me. Um, how do you stay inspired? How do you keep your brand so fresh? Um, over all of this time um, and stay, how have you done that? How have you had the mental, how have you done it? It's just incredible. I have, I like, my hat is off to you. How have you done that? Been able to keep that brand so strong and so fresh? Well, you, you have to appreciate um, the, the question we became immersed in with Michelle um, that the problem is so difficult to solve because the problem represents a problem with the development of human life. Yeah. Every aspect of human life beyond anything we've ever addressed before. So it's not how do I stay interested in it. 
It's how does it stay interested in me mm -hmm. sufficiently to keep me alive, working on it to the degree that's needed. Because Tom, let me say that my greatest problem is that the problem is bigger than any one of us. And that's what has arisen in the work that I do. The problem is bigger than any one of us. I can't even begin to challenge the weight, the size, the measure of the problem to the degree called for. I simply don't have it within me sufficiently to uncover the complexity of it and to approach it in the simplified way it calls for demands. That what I'm dealing with is an art form can't be better described than that, an art form that's beyond me. And because it's an art form that's beyond me, beyond you, beyond any of us, it represents a challenge, a challenge that I welcome every single human being on the planet to engage with. And that's what has kept me connected to it. It's that, oh my God, no, it's not that. It's this. Yeah. Oh my God, it's not this. It's that. Oh my God, it's not this and that. It's that and this and that. And <laughs> right. Who's got the time? Who's got the energy? Who's got the wherewithal? Who's got the intelligence? You follow me. So the job is bigger than any of us. Yeah. We solve that problem. We, we sitting here, we solve that problem. We transform the state of human life worldwide. Not just in the thinking about it, but in the actual practice of it. So I want you to imagine, Tom, that's what we're engaged in, transforming the practice of being human in everything we do. Mm. It's called, holy shit. You mean we can do that? So that's what's calling every one of us. Whether we've come to the realization of that or not is another question, but that's what's calling each and every one of us. That massive, massive, massive question transform the state of humanity worldwide. Michael, let me ask you a question. You're talking about transforming humanity. I want to just talk about the transformation of an individual entrepreneur. Um, and you actually brought this up a minute ago with the Beyond the Image. You said one to 1,000. And, I, and I, I think about the transformation or the evolution that an entrepreneur has to go through during that time period as being massive because in the very beginning, we are chief cook and bottle washer and everything does depend on us. And as we grow, we have to learn how to trust our team, delegate, build our team, all those things. Um, what advice would you give someone who is sort of in the middle there? They're starting to make that transition um, and finding it difficult like all of us. Quit. Do you say quit? Quit. Stop. Start over again. We're going to start at the beginning. Start over end your business, it's not going to succeed anyway. You're not going to succeed anyway. Quit. Start at the beginning. 
And when I say that, understand how harsh that is in one respect, because hope, <laughs> hope and need and all the things that live in that question um, says, oh, come on, come on, come on. I'm saying stop, quit, start anew. We're going to start working on you as a human being first. Long before we ever get to becoming an entrepreneur. First you as a human being, David as a human being. And that's what we're going to do. That's the work. Now, were we to discover that were we to have the patience for that, were we to design, build, launch, and grow that, something absolutely miraculous would occur. So I'm saying if we were to start this whole thing with high school kids, the very first day of high school, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, from the very first day of high school, um, we would begin to design, build, launch, and grow our people. To a degree we never have. And as we begin to do that, as a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, a senior, graduated from high school into a new engagement of four years. Now we're working on our human being for eight years in an intelligent, extraordinarily devoted way. Can you imagine the person we'd be facing four years after graduating from high school? You can't, you can't even begin to imagine who that person would be. You follow me? But only then would they be ready to begin. But I'll guarantee you, significantly fewer of them will begin to be entrepreneurs. Thank God. Michael, on that note, you know, one of the things as you begin to scale a business and as you go from one to a thousand to an enterprise, you're going to have to work with people, right? And we talked about people development. In your decades of experience, do you have any advice or tips when it comes to finding and hiring A-level talent for your business? Well, th that's obviously a system. Um, obviously, how you select the people you hire, what you put them through before you ever bring them aboard, um, how you determine um, their makeup before you ever bring them aboard. Um, create a, a method for that madness, and the people you bring aboard will be immensely different than the people you're bringing aboard today. What is that military um, group? The elite military Navy. The Marines? U.S. Navy SEALs. Oh, okay. They're elite. They're okay, too. Think about U.S. Navy SEALs for the moment. The SEALs um, put people through living hell before they ever get to become a beginner, a Navy SEAL. And yet, 90% um, of those who become a Navy SEAL drop out before they become a Navy SEAL. 90% drop out before they become a Navy SEAL. And the ones who become beginners have been through an immense amount of development. 
before they're ever qualified to go through the first stages. And then the Navy SEALs put them through living hell. Put that down to living hell. Challenging, 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 challenging. You follow me? That's your yeah. job. Hear me? How do you expect them to become stars? Challenging, 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 challenging. So that's the process. It's so far beyond anything we do. It's so far beyond anything anybody expects to do, believes they need to do, wants to do. Because none of the people in your organization have ever been through it. Challenging, 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 challenging. How do you expect them to bring aboard people who will do it? They won't. Why would they? Challenging, 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 challenging. You understand the danger that creates for your people? So you've got to start this over here. You see where I'm putting my, you got to start this over here. There are two organizations within your organization, every single one of you. There is Old Co. and there is New Co. You're not here to grow Old Co. You're here to grow New Co. And New Co, N E W, capital C O, Old Co, O L W, capital C O. Old Co is the past. New Co is the future. You're here to design, build, launch, and grow New Co. That's your Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. The question then is, do you have the measure in you to design, build, launch, and grow your Navy SEALs? Hear me, that's not an easy question to answer. Unfortunately, it is because we don't really ever address it. You know, give me a break, Gerber. <laughs> Give me a break. I don't even want to create a Navy SEALs in my business. But that's what it takes. That's what it takes. So you're going to go to work on new co while you go to work on old co. And you're going to work on old co to keep it from failing but it's not the future yeah michael i think it's an important mindset shift that the listeners take of you know with your analogy of navy seals and your that's the type of talent that you need to be developing for your business in order to grow it to that new co so i really appreciate that and i hope our listeners go back and re-listen to that that's a huge mindset shift that mm -hmm. business owners need to have when they begin to hire talent. Yes, but hear me, it's a huge mindset and soul set. S-O-U-L, soul set for you. Don't you dare tell that story until you've set your soul to it. And please be careful about telling yourself that you've set your soul to it. Because if you haven't set your soul to it, it's going to chew you up and spit you out because you're not going to match it. And the last thing I want to do is to put you into the grinder, the soul grinder that will put you in. So you'll say one day, Kerber, the day you told me that story was the day it went out of business. Michael, I have a question. I'm curious. So we all know you because we've read your books, books, and how has being a published author, when you first set out, how has being
being a published author helped to build your authority and really helped to establish you as the expert? And follow on to that, would you recommend that other business owners follow that same path? Um, my books have set the soul for our business without question. Um, my books have set the soul for the creation of our business, for the development of our business, um, for the uh, activation of clients for our business, for the communication of our business. Our books have set the soul for the soul of our business. So yes, without a doubt. And I didn't write my book until 10 years into my business. You follow me? Um, what was the further end of that question? Would you recommend that other business owners, because that's really opened up so much opportunity for you, would you recommend other business owners as they've evolved and grown into their business, learning things that they share that also in a book and leverage being? Well, you see that everybody has. Mm. Uh, there's no question about it, that you look at those other guys who have, in quotes, copied me, They've copied me by writing their version of my book. Now, please, again, that's not my narcissism speaking. It's just true. Um, they've copied me by writing their version of my book. So I can only say that, yes, writing a book about that, um, I believe, is a critical piece of the puzzle because the means through which you communicate um, to a larger and larger and larger audience, um, and then doing that through podcasts, um, as we're doing now, uh, enables you to share that message, open that marketplace, read the book, stupid, read the book, stupid, etc., 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 etc. And of course, the book says then what to do next. Obviously. So, yes, I would recommend that and have recommended that. Awesome. With this cautionary tale, most people write a bad book. Uh, most books fail, but most businesses fail. Um, it's much easier to fail writing a book um, than it is failing writing a business because you don't see the business fail um, in time for you to um, get ready for it. Uh, the book fails so obviously. Um, the average book sells fewer than 250 copies. And that with a lot of work. Got it? Got it. Yes, thank you. Michael, I just want to be the first one to thank you. Really appreciate your time and being here with all of us and sharing your message with anyone listening. I want to point everyone to all of your books, you know, E-Myth and E-Myth Beyond, and also MichaelEGerberCompanies.com to check out everything that you have going on. And just want to thank you for everything you've done for all of us over the years. My delight. Thank you. And might I say, um, you might be clearer in your description of your guest and what you expect of your guest um, as compared to what you expect of your audience. And that will help grandly. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Michael. It's such an honor to meet you. I wish you the best luck. for listening to the Power of Authority Spotlight. If you are a successful founder, entrepreneur, business owner, or leader that's getting results and making a difference, and you'd like to be on this program, please visit performancepublishinggroup.com forward slash podcast to apply. That's performancepublishinggroup.com forward slash podcast. Also, if you got something out of this interview, please share this episode. Just do a quick screenshot with your phone and text it to a friend or post it on the socials. If you know someone that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag, the power of authority spotlight. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content, so make sure you don't miss any episodes by subscribing. 
Your thumbs up, ratings, and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and mean a lot to me and my team. Want to know more? Go to our websites, performancepublishinggroup.com or michelleprince.com. And follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.